this week I will talk about quantum Fourier transform beyond Shor's algorithm. Uh, so quantum Fourier transform has lots of applications in quantum computing and the most well-known application I guess is uh, for Shor's algorithm for factoring in large integer numbers. Now I kind of assume that you know that result and I will tell you everything except Shor's algorithm which is uh, hopefully covered in your curriculum before. So in this first day, I would like to cover basics. Uh, because, uh, <clears throat> uh, well, you have a diverse background and uh, some of you might be uh, less familiar with the topic, so I wanted to make sure that everyone is up to speed. So uh, this first day, I will introduce uh, the discrete Fourier transform and its quantum uh, analog, the quantum Fourier transform. Uh, and this is the first part so of this first lecture. And so I'm mostly reviewing, uh, uh, so if you want to learn more details and, and read more details about the topic that I'm talking today, then I am just reviewing uh, chapter four of Ronald DeWald's excellent quantum computing lecture notes. Uh, you can see the, maybe it's, it's in our archive uh, on this link. And so if you want to uh, get more details than what I can tell you in this, uh, a lecture, then you can head over there and read more. So the Fourier transform is, is a widely used theoretical and practical tool. Uh, and and uh, originally it was developed to isolate different periodic parts of function, signal, or something similar. Uh, and it has, wide, it has lots of applications in theory, for example, for solving differential equations. It's a invaluable tool. Also, it's related to the uncertainty principle in quantum mechanics between uh, position and momentum. So lots of theoretical interesting applications, but also uh, <coughs> when you discretize the Fourier transform and make this continuous Fourier transform something discrete, then it's very useful in applications. Uh, uh, for example, in signal processing, uh, processing music or sound, image processing, for example, in JPEG compression, uh, and fast multiplication of polynomials. And of course, quantum computing, we have lots of interesting applications that we will cover during this week. Um, and I will tell you more about the connection to, to the continuous Fourier transform and how the two relate. That will be a topic for tomorrow. But first, let's cover uh, the discrete Fourier transform. Uh, the, the discrete Fourier transform is, is a unitary map over uh, complex vectors of dimension n. And it's a particular matrix whose matrix elements are evenly spread out in the sense that they have the same absolute value in a computational basis. Uh, so in particular, uh, this n-dimensional uh, discrete Fourier transform is the following matrix. Uh, all the matrix elements will have uh, absolute value one over square root n, and all the matrix elements are some powers of a root of unity, which is this exponential to the minus two pi i divided by n. So this omega n is this uh, particular root of unity, and the j column, and the, uh, sorry, the j row and the k column of this matrix is simply this root of unity to the power j times k. So, so this is just the uh, element in the j column, j, j row and k column. Uh, and so here we are indices, these indices are running from zero to n minus one for the rows and the columns. Uh, and here I should note, yeah, so in particular, uh, most of you are probably familiar with the Hadamard transform, uh, which is uh, just the Fourier transform over two elements. So here, this root of unity is just minus one and uh, well, if you just take these powers of minus one as in this formula, then just get exactly the Hadamard matrix. Um, and here I should know that uh, I'm using a mathematics convention for the signs in the Fourier transform. So uh, in mathematics, usually the, the Fourier transform is defined by this minus sign in the exponent. Uh, and this might deviate from 
some other literature, part of literature that, that you are familiar with, now we are sticking to this convention. Uh, so so in, in some other uh, lecture notes and, and, and papers, you will see this will be a plus sign instead of a minus. That doesn't make any major difference. It's just a convention that you are really free to choose. Just make sure that you stick uh, to the convention that you have chosen. OK. So let's uh, review the properties of the discrete Fourier transform. A very important property is that it's a unitary matrix. And uh, you can see this just computing what's the inner product between uh, the k column and the k pride column. I just wrote this out exactly here for you. And so if you do this uh, uh, calculation, you realize that taking this uh, complex conjugate here just means that we are putting a minus sign in the exponent of this root of unity. So this is uh, omega n to the minus jk and omega n to the jk prime. Then I just put together the exponents and I get this expression. And this will be 1 if and only if k equals k prime, and otherwise it will be 0. Uh, yes, so <coughs> one way to view is, is just algebraically doing this uh, summation of, of a geometric sequence that gives you uh, this exactly. Or uh, you can also view this uh, in geometric uh, picture. Uh, so here you have your nth uh, root of unity. And as you are taking powers, it's just going to rotate the root of unity. Uh, excuse me for my drawing skills. The angles should be uh, equal everywhere, but imagine that they are equal. Um, and so because you are uh, summing up over n rotations, and this was an nth root of unity, uh, or, or maybe some, some not, not exactly this one, but some higher one, they all point in a different direction in a way that they all they exactly cancel out. So this is a geometric picture of the same thing that you can also do, do algebraically by just uh, summing up this geometric sequence. Yes. Okay, some other properties are that uh, <coughs> uh, if you look at this matrix, it's a symmetric matrix, and therefore, uh, and it's a unitary matrix which is symmetric. So if you take the adjoint, which is the uh, conjugate transpose, transpose is the same. So the inverse of the Fourier transform will be just its complex conjugate. So we just replace all the uh, these omega n's by by their uh, complex conjugate, which is which has the opposite sign in the exponent. Uh, and for notation, uh, it's common to, to denote the Fourier transform of a vector by putting a hat on top. Uh, so if we had the vector v and we apply the discrete Fourier transform, then the, the Fourier transform vector is often denoted by v hat. Um, and there is an important classical algorithm uh, the fast Fourier transform, which, when co which can compute this uh, Fourier transform vector in only n log n steps, which is uh, much improved compared to the naive algorithm that would just compute the matrix vector multiplication. Uh, and since this is an n by n matrix, that would uh, require you going through all the n square elements, so it would require n square steps. Now, using this uh, clever algorithm, you can just get away by n log n uh, steps instead. And uh, this fast Fourier transform algorithm is really important, not only in quantum computing, but also uh, in, in classical computer science. Really, it's very widely used in, in signal processing whenever you do some MRI imaging or something, signal processing is he heavily using this fast Fourier transform algorithm. Uh, OK, so now let's uh, switch to the quantum side of the story 
and, and take a look at uh, efficient implementations of this discrete Fourier transform, but inside a quantum computer. And for this, uh, let's assume that uh, for simplicity, this n uh, is just the power of two. And then, uh, well, by definition, we know that uh, the k basis state by the discrete Fourier transform is a map to the uniform superposition, well, over, over these uh, j's, but with these phases described by this root of unity to j k power. Uh, and uh, one of the key observations will be that, that this is a easy to prepare state. Uh, and in fact, uh, we, we, I will show you that uh, only uh, lowercase n square one and two qubit gate suffices to implement this Fourier transform. And uh, so in a way, this gives an exponential speed up because capital N was the dimension of the vector of which we compute the Fourier transform. And we can get away by doing lowercase n, which is its logarithm, uh, or, or polynomial many in, in logarithm, uh, quantum gates. But one important thing to note here is that access to the output is, is limited. So in classical case, we get all the coordinates of this vector fully written out. So we have much uh, stronger access to it in the quantum computer when we only have a quantum state whose amplitudes are Fourier transformed. So the quantum Fourier transform does something different uh, in, in this sense that it prepares a quantum state, but does so much more efficiently. And the key property that helps uh, for this efficient implementation of, the, of this Fourier transform uh, is that if you just take a computational basis state, this k, then uh, its discrete Fourier transform is really a product state. And, and to explain why is it the case, uh, it's useful to write out these j and k numbers in a binary. So that, that's one of the reasons why we stick to uh, capital N, which is a power of two. So in particular, j and k can be described by n bits, j1 being the most significant bit and j n being the least significant bit, each of them having value zero and one. And this is really just a binary uh, string corresponding to this number j and k. Uh, okay, now this is a bit longer equation, but I will walk you through it step by step. So uh, the first is just the definition of, of the uh, discrete Fourier transform of the basis state k. And uh, we can just write this out uh, by first writing out j in binary. So j, which was a number between zero and n minus one, we just write it down with n bits. And uh, correspondingly, uh, we compute this, uh, uh, the corresponding <coughs> exponents. And so it, there used to be a division by n, but that is uh, counteracted by the uh, place value of these, uh, of these bits. Uh, and so when, when we just write out uh, j in binary, then, then we get this formula. Uh, and we use that these phases just uh, can be uh, taken as a product. So basically, we separate the contribution of each bit to this phase. That's what it happens in the first step. So we're just writing out everything in binary. Uh, and so in the second step, uh, we, we further collect together uh, these bits. Well, one of the observations is that the absolute value, the amplitude absolute value of everything is one over two to the n. So uh, if, if we decompose it to n qubits, then the amplitude of each of them should be one over square root two in this tensor product, so that's clear. And if you expand uh, this, this uh, second term, then you see that uh, in the alt position, you pick up this phase in the exponent uh, exactly 
um, <coughs> when the corresponding bit is one in the left hand side. So that the phase is picked up by the alt qubit if and only if the alt qubit is in state one. And that's exactly what is on the left hand side. So this is how you can call like these terms together. This is this second equation. And uh, the last one is really just rewriting this. Um, so interpreting this, this number k over 2 to the l in binary. And so here one observation is that, well, when you divide k by 2 to the l, then it will have some integer part and some uh, fractional part. But integer times 2 pi i, that just wraps around. So the integer part we can forget about. And this effectively means that only uh, the last n minus l bits of k matter in this expression. We can drop the previous ones because that's just wrapping around some integer multiple times 2 pi i. So yeah, this is uh, now compact rewriting of the Fourier transform of the basis state k. And this is going to the basic, uh, the basis of the efficient quantum circuit implementation. So <coughs> I will rather describe the circuit for the case of three qubits. And then you will see how it uh, generalizes further. But for simplicity, let's discuss this case. So if I have a basis state k1, k2, k3, these are the bits, then it's a dimensional Fourier transform has this product form. This was the expression that we devised in the uh, previous slide. So in particular, uh, in the first qubit, this phase only depends on the third bit of k. For the second qubit, its phase component depends on the second and the third qubit, but not the first one. And for the last qubit, actually, its phase depends on all of the bits of k. So what we will do is that we will first do everything that depends on the first qubit. And while well, that, <coughs> that is only present in this last term, so we first will construct this qubit. Once we constructed this qubit, we can forget the value of k1. Then we, we proceed, and here it only depends on k2, k3. So now we process this, this second qubit from the uh, end. And after this, k2 can be jettisoned, and, and finally we do the last qubit. Uh, and for the actual implementation, we will need some rotation gates. These rotation gates will be the ones that, that add these phase factors to the, uh, to the qubits that we wish to apply this. So this rotation by S will be not affecting the zero qubit state, but for the one qubit state, it applies this e to the minus two pi i divided by two to the S phase. And uh, here we should note that this is really uh, once again, the generalization of the Hadamard, uh, sorry, uh, sorry, this is, this is for the Z gate. Or what, sorry, I'm, I'm doing something here. Uh, sorry, this is the typo. So, I'm sorry, this is not the Hadamard gate, but uh, Hadamard gate is the Fourier transform over, over a single bit. This is typo, I'm sorry for that. So what this H does uh, is that it prepares, if, if K1 was zero, and it prepares a uniform superposition of zero and one. So when the K1 bit was zero, then there was no phase contribution from K1 here. And if uh, the K1 bit was one, then it adds a phase because Hadamard matrix has, has a minus one here that adds a phase factor here as necessary. Uh, and so I ignore this line, uh, that was a mistake. So once we did the Hadamard transform, we collected all the information necessary from this K1 bit and put it into this final bit here. Then we still need to uh, apply a phase depending on the second bit of K. And that is exactly done 
by this rotation. And, and the angle is correct because we divide by the necessary power uh, in this exponent. And then, well, this uh, last qubit phase of the one is also dependent on the third bit and that once again a control rotation does the job for us. So these first three gates here prepare uh, the product state for the last qubit of the output exactly as we desired. And uh, similarly as before, now we apply Hadamard to correctly put the phase information from the K2 bit here, and then also add uh, the phase information from the last bit. Finally, just apply a Hadamard, <coughs> Hadamard transformation on the last qubit, and that prepares finally this superposition. Uh, this phase means that it is a plus or minus one depending on just the value of the third bit. But uh, as this story shows, we first prepared the last qubit of the desired state and then a second and a first. So ultimately we need to swap the order of the output bits to get the correct representation of the, of the uh, Fourier transform state. And uh, the case for n larger than three is exactly analogous. We just have one more rotation gate with one smaller angle and so on. You can uh, do it for every n. So this is the efficient uh, implementation of the quantum Fourier transform for powers of two. And while well, you can see that basically preparing the nth qubit of this uh, product state, we are using uh, n quantum gates for that qubit. And so, and, and we have n of these qubits, so that therefore you get roughly n squared divided by two uh, gates in total. <coughs> okay, so uh, I assume that most of you probably have, have seen this, but uh, this is really uh, the fundamental uh, circuit for all the applications in the week, so I thought we should definitely cover it. Uh, one thing that is less known, probably, that you can also implement an efficient quantum Fourier transform circuit when n is not a power of two. It's a bit more complicated, but you can do an exact circuit and that has similar complexity to this. So ultimately, we don't have to assume that n is a power of two, there is efficient implementation otherwise. Uh, but in a way, we can, we can implement that uh, arbitrary Fourier transform over arbitrary integers n uh, using this uh, binary, this, this uh, power of two uh, quantum Fourier transform circuit. And there will be um, exercise about this. So the exercise sheet, which uh, you should receive uh, after lunch, contains uh, some, uh, some, some standard exercises which are uh, helping you to understand this concept if you are not so familiar with, uh, and contains two uh, much more advanced exercises, which, which is for those of you who are uh, already uh, fluent with these basics, but you want to learn more about this topic. And in particular, this is an exercise about uh, doing this quantum Fourier transform for arbitrary n, which is, I think, a very interesting exercise. Okay, so now, this was the first part uh, about quantum Fourier transform, so I think it's a good point to stop and ask if you have any questions, because the second part will be slightly different topic. Okay, well, if you, if you don't have any questions now, then just ask me questions uh, as we go on. Okay, so now it's a review of the hidden subgroup problem for abelian groups. Um, and this is once again, I am following the lecture notes of Ronald de Wolf. Uh, there is no need to invent the wheel. Um, so if you want to uh, get more background and material, once again, you can uh, head to the archive and, and look at Ronald's lecture notes. So uh, in order to, to define and, and correctly uh, 
describe Fourier transform on finite groups, we need a bit of uh, background on, on representation theory of groups. So <coughs> representation theory in general uses linear algebra to study groups. Uh, that's the idea. And uh, so if you are given a, well, these concepts can be generalized to uh, infinite groups as well, but from now on I will specialize to finite groups because we want to implement these on a quantum computer and our quantum computer is mostly finite, so that's the relevant case, but these concepts have infinite dimensional uh, and infinite size uh, analogs which we don't cover, but th those are nevertheless very interesting uh, theoretical extensions. Okay, so what's a representation? It's a homomorphism from your group um, into the multiplicative group of d by d complex matrices. And, and such a homomorphism is called a d-dimensional representation. So what it means that if you have two group elements, uh, then you can either first multiply them in the group, get a new element and map that using the homomorphism, and you should get the same result as if you first take the two group elements, map them to the corresponding matrices, and multiply the matrices, then you should get the same result. And uh, such a representation is called irreducible uh, if and only if no non-trivial subspace is invariant under all linear maps or matrices in the image of phi. So what it means, uh, phi maps your group elements to matrices. These matrices have some eigenvectors, eigenvalues, and, and accordingly they have invariant subspaces. The trivial invariant subspaces is the empty subspace that's always mapped to itse itself under linear map, and also the entire space is always invariant under such a map. Um, and so a representation is irreducible if there is no subspace that which is lying between zero and the entire space, which is invariant under all linear maps that, uh, that are in the image of this map. And uh, so we will now mostly focus on the abelian case. Uh, and there uh, we will focus on one dimensional representations, which are also called a character. Uh, and so in particular, a character is a map from your group to the multiplicative group of the complex numbers. And well, if you just apply this homomorphism property, you can see that the character uh, mapping the unit element, well, it maps, since e unit element is equals its square, it's a, it's a homomorphic image is the same. And uh, now we are using this uh, property of homomorphic property that, uh, that this complex number equals its square and this means that the unit element must be mapped to the, to the uh, one of the complex numbers. Uh, and using the, this and uh, Lagrange's theorem for groups, we get that one equals the image of the unit element of the group. And the unit element of group by the Lagrange theorem is, is the same as any group element uh, to the power uh, of the number of elements in the group. And by the homomorphic property, that's the same as the image of the group element to the jit power. And so this uh, little computation shows that this, uh, that, that, that such a character uh, must map every group element to a g absolute value. So, so, the, so the, the size of the group uh, root of unity for every group element. Uh, so this, this just gives you a bit more handle that every character is mapping group elements to some root of unities which are uh, matching the size of the group. And uh, once again, for abelian groups, we have the nice property that all the irreducible representations are in fact one-dimensional and, uh, and they are exactly 
as many represent as, as many characters, uh, one dimensional representations, than the size of the loop itself. Uh, and uh, the character group is uh, also called sometimes the dual group of this group G, and that contains the one dimensional representations of the group G. Uh, and we denote this character group by G hat, and that also hints at the Fourier uh, analytic uh, relevance of this concept. And this is a group under pointwise multiplication. So if we have two characters, two one dimensional representations, phi and ki from G to C, uh, then the pointwise multiplication or in this character group is which is denoted by phi times key g that just uh, multiply the, the image of g times the image of key as, as you would multiply two functions pointwise. And under this uh, action, they form a group. Okay, and uh, so now let's discuss the Fourier transform on finite abelian groups. Uh, Cyclic groups are the easiest. We already defined basically that. So we can consider the kth column of the discrete Fourier transform as a character, uh, such that we, we define the image of J as simply the J row of the kth column of the Fourier transform. And there is a normalization, so we need to multiply this matrix sum by square root m. And this way, we get this uh, root of unity omega n to the j times k. And clearly, uh, because key k j equals omega to the j times k, we have that this is uh, indeed a hom homomorphism. So let's look at the image of j plus j prime under this uh, map. And that, by definition, is just this root of unity to j plus j prime power times k. And while well, that is just the product of the corresponding characters pointwise. So indeed, uh, we have this homomorphic property that key k j plus j prime just key k j times key k j prime. And so here I use the additive notation for these uh, elements of the cyclic group because it's an abelian group. And uh, <coughs> we can consider, uh, therefore, this discrete Fourier transform as a map from uh, the group G to G hat because uh, Fourier transform maps the k basis elements to the k column, and that's just a normalized version of the vector corresponding to this k character. And this is not just any map, but it's also important uh, that this map is actually a homomorphism. So uh, if you take here two different elements, k and k prime, then k plus k prime is mapped to the product key k times key k prime. So Fourier transform is a nice homomorphism acting between G and G hat. And so this is for the cyclic groups. The cyclic groups uh, and their Fourier transform is just this, this homomorphic map between uh, the group and its character group. Uh, and in general, we know that any abelian group has just as many characters as the group itself. Moreover, they are orthogonal to each other. And this is a very good property because we want to study unitary transformations in quantum computing, and the characters of abelian group are already orthogonal to each other, so we have a chance of defining a unitary matrix that, uh, that is useful for quantum computing. And uh, moreover, there is this uh, so-called basis theorem from group theory, uh, which states that every finite abelian group is in fact 
isomorphic to a product, or if you are using additive notation to the direct sum of cyclic groups. So you have a finite abelian group G that's always isomorphic to product of these different cyclic groups, N1, N2, and so on, and T uh, the, with uh, those orders. Uh, <coughs> and uh, this hints at uh, the generalization of this Fourier transform. The characters of G, according to this decomposition, will be simply tensor products of their cyclic components. Uh, so in particular, the, the character group will be isomorphic to the uh, product of the, of the uh, character group of the N1 length cyclic group, N2 length, and so on, which are, of, co of course, themselves. So we have seen that uh, the character group of N1 is, uh, is basically itself, but uh, we can think about this in a different way. So uh, the discrete Fourier transform is this homomorphic map which maps the cyclic group Z N1 to its uh, character group Z hat N1. And that is exactly the Fourier transform F N1, discrete Fourier transform. Uh, now we have a product structure both over the group and its character group and accordingly uh, the Fourier transform over the group is just uh, isomorphic to the tensor product of the Fourier transforms over each cyclic component. So if, uh, <coughs> if my group is really not isomorphic but is actually the product of these, of these cyclic groups, then the corresponding Fourier transform is actually the uh, <coughs> the tensor product of this discrete Fourier transform. But now we have this isomorphism, so we need, to, we need to use this isomorphism, which translates group elements in G to group elements in this product. And, and exactly, we need to take that isomorphism, which is just a, basically a permutation or like a bijection between the elements. And under this bijection, we get the Fourier transform for the general group FG. Yes, so this is how you define Fourier transform over an arbitrary abelian group. And uh, this homomorphic uh, structure, homomorphic structure of this uh, Fourier transform will then follow naturally from the homomorphic structure of each of the individual Fourier transforms. So we keep this property that, uh, that this is a homomorphic map between G and G hat for every abelian group. Okay, and so now it's time to, now after this uh, representation theory recap, we can finally uh, state this hidden subgroup problem, which is uh, where quantum computers excel. And this is a generalization of, of uh, Shor's algorithm and lots of other interesting algebraic uh, things including the discrete logarithm and so on. Uh, so here is the abstract definition. Uh, as input, we assume a function which, which maps the group elements to some set X. Uh, really this X does not have to, this doesn't have to have any structure. This is just a set, the only requirement is that this F should hide the subgroup H in the sense uh, that uh, two group elements should be mapped to the same uh, X value if and only if uh, these two group elements are in the same coset of, of uh, the hidden subgroup H, meaning that G1H as a set equals G, G2H. Uh, so in other words, uh, we have a function which, is, which we can think about this as an injective function on cosets because uh, the value of the function only depends on the coset of a given group element. 
and otherwise for different cosets it gives different values. So this is a requirement. We need to have such a hiding function which hides in this sense the subgroup H. And of course the goal is to find the subgroup H itself uh, with a few queries to F. Well one thing is asking a few queries and one thing is being efficient so while we will not only want to have a few queries to F but actually also an efficient quantum circuit which uses only a few gates to solve this problem. Uh, and, and so this is the this is what is solved by this uh, main algorithm. And so here is the quantum circuit for the algorithm that solves the hidden subgroup problem on a quantum computer. So here we need to start with the uniform superposition uh, over the group elements. So we need to assume that we can somehow prepare this uniform superposition. Assuming we can do that, uh, we just need to apply this this function, which is uh, here I denoted by an oracle. Uh, so this is some quantum circuit that computes the function values. And then we measure the output register and apply quantum Fourier transform over the group G, finally measure it. So this is the circuit, but it needs uh, quite a bit of explanation what it does and why it makes sense. So let's just see uh, how this acts. So we have a uniform superposition over the group elements in the first register and we have uh, a zero state and this zero state is just here to accommodate the function evaluation. So this oracle f which I didn't specify in details, what it does that it maps can you hear me now it's I don't know somehow it was misbehaving all the time is it back now Okay, um, <laughs> all right. So uh, this oracle, what it does, if you provide it with a group element G and the fresh register containing a zero ancilla, then it just uh, computes the function value in the second register. And it only needs to compute it when the ancilla qubit is, and this ancilla register is zero in the initial state. It don't need anything more than that. So we have the uniform superposition over the group elements and then a fresh ancilla here. We just apply the oracle and then for every G we get the corresponding function value here. Nothing special happens. But then the measurement, uh, we perform a measurement uh, on, the, on the output register where the function values are stored. And we get some X, like a lowercase X uh, value which we don't know what we get, but it doesn't really matter. We get some element and we know that, uh, so which are the group elements that are consistent with, uh, with the equation that f of g equals x? Well, take any preimage of x, so that f inverse x is just any, any group element which I didn't be by S here, which is mapped to X. And we know that this function is constant on cosets, so we can get all the elements of uh, which map to X by just looping through this subgroup H and shifting this, uh, this initial element by, by every element of this subgroup. <coughs> so, this is exactly the, the part of the quantum state which is uh, consistent with the measurement outcome X. And so we had the uniform superposition previously, the uniformity uh, is retained, but now this particular measurement outcome restricts the elements <coughs> over this set. 
And uh, so here comes the last step. I don't want to add text. OK. So here comes the last step. The key ingredient is when we apply finally the quantum Fourier transform. And so uh, what it does, it maps this S plus H group element to this character key S plus H. And while this, this last register, I wrote it out, it remains, but we can really forget about it. It doesn't really matter what X is. Uh, and we, we will explicitly drop it in the next slide. And so remember this normalization, the one over square root H comes from this uniformity over the group elements H. And this one over square root G, that was just how we defined the Fourier transform. So uh, this character, every, every element, uh, so every, every point of this function, if you would, discuss, uh, this, this character function is the root of unity. So to get a, a unit length vector, we need to divide by the square root of the size of the group. And so this is why we have this in the uh, denominator. OK, and so now the question remains, why does it give anything useful if we measure the first register, which is not the x value that we got? Uh, and so this is what we need to understand. What is the outcome of the measurement of the final state? So uh, I dropped now here the value x and just <coughs> wrote this superposition over uh, these characters after the Fourier transform. Uh, and uh, well, basically, I just write down the definition of this character state that is just the value of key uh, of this S plus H character evaluated at G. And then we have there the group element as well. So really, it is just writing out what was the definition of this uh, character state. Uh, and in the next step, we use that this character is a homomorphism. So when I have the S plus H character, then it is just the product of the S and H character. So I just uh, write this a product. And uh, notice that this key as G that doesn't depend on anything in H, so I can just pull it through this summation. So uh, <coughs> this is how I get uh, this second line equation. And so the, the final step, which is uh, a bit more challenging, is that we will get some some state like this, but uh, OK, let, let me explain what is written here and why is that the outcome. So for the last equality, uh, we need to understand a few, few things about the structure of these characters. So uh, if you take any, any character on the group G, then you can restrict it to H. So a character is a map from the group to the complex numbers. Now you have a subgroup, a homomorphism. And also, it will be homomorphism on a subgroup itself, still a map on it, so you can restrict it. And it will be a character of H itself. Uh, and now we also introduce this notation H perp, which will be a subgroup of the character group. Uh, and exactly those characters are contained which will be the constant one function on elements of H. Clearly, if you have two characters, and they are constant one on the subgroup H, if you multiply them, that is just multiplication pointwise, they will still be constant one on every element of the subgroup H. So this is a subgroup, and it's, uh, it's a well-defined <coughs> set. It, it, for example, certainly contains this unit, unique, uh, unit element. <coughs> so we can define it. OK, so now I introduce this H perp uh, group. And uh, <coughs> so now I'm studying this part of this equation, this sum, sum over all the elements in the subgroup, 
and the character evaluated at this uh, element g times this uh, group element itself in, in this notation. So here one important thing is that you can swap the, the argument and the subscript of these uh, of these characters. So remember, <coughs> it's not in the board, so I might write it, that uh, for Zn, we had that uh, he, okay, uh, I don't know, can you see it from the background? Can you see it from the last rows? Okay, so key k j, that was just omega n to the j times k. Okay, and, and for this clearly you can see that this is now the same thing as chi j evaluated at k. Okay, so it just uh, appears as a product in this uh, root of unity. So you have clearly this, uh, uh <coughs> this equation. Uh, now if you have something like Zn1 cross Zn2, uh, then the characters are just products uh, of the individual characters. So, <coughs> so key uh, k1, k2, the element j1, j2, this will be just the product of chi k1, j1 times chi k2, J2, uh, and here you can swap things individually as we shown. So this will be equal now chi J1 K1 times chi J2 K2. Okay, so now we swapped the subscript and the argument and uh, once again, we can just put everything together. That will be chi j1 j2 at k1 k2. Okay, so this swapping works for cyclic groups by definition very clearly. <coughs> and also by this product structure, it works for product of two cyclic groups or more cyclic groups, therefore, for every finite abelian groups by the basis theorem. Okay, so in this first equation, we can just swap the argument and the subscript. And uh, so now the next thing that we should understand is that this summation, uh, well, clearly, if you are in this H perp, that means that this chi g is constant one on every element of the subgroup. And so you get just uh, the size of the subgroup h. And otherwise, uh, it will be not the constant one. And similar to how this, uh, in the cyclic groups, this rotation and times canceled exactly, that same thing happens here. And this will be exactly zero for the other elements. Uh, yes. Well, one, uh, one other way to see it is that there is no room for here everything else to be because it's already uh, the normalization uh, makes it sure that it's already maximum norm. So already these elements in this summation uh, give rise to norm one uh, quantum state, so there can nothing else be here. That's just another way of seeing this identity. Okay, so this summation over this hidden subgroup gives rise to a factor which is the size of the group. So this 
divided by square root h factor becomes by a multiply by square root h factor, but only those g's remains which were for which the corresponding uh, character was in h perp. And otherwise, uh, oh yeah, and, and, and we have this multiplicative factor, the s, s character evaluated g, but this is just a root of unity. So when we measure this state, this factor really doesn't matter. What, what really matters is that we have uniform superposition over g's that are labels of this h perp group. So ultimately, what we get is a uniformly random uh, element of the group such that the corresponding character is in h perp. And, and this uniformity is the only thing that matters. Uh, and so how you uh, finally decode uh, the hidden subgroup is that you repeat this algorithm several times, and each time you will get a new uniformly random G. And this is a linear constraint on the subgroup H because we determined that, that chi, G, chi G on H will be one for every element of the subgroup. So basically, as you obtain more and more labels G, that gives you more and more constraint on the element H. And uh, well, essentially collecting a, a logarithmic number of, of, of constraints, uh, when, when you have this uniform sampling property that we ensured, uh, actually little argument shows that it suffices to uniquely determine the subgroup H. Now, well, of course, you, could, you can have some tiny uh, error probability, but uh, if you repeat this process a few times, then this will exponentially go to zero. So with very, very high probability, you determine the correct subgroup H. And uh, yes, so this finishes the Abelian uh, hidden subgroup problem. And in the exercise sheet, uh, you will see examples that uh, show how period finding, discrete logarithm, and generalized discrete logarithm problems are all instances of this abstract looking concept. And therefore, we have efficient quantum algorithms for them. We know the implications, breaking shore, and, and even discrete logarithm based cryptography. Uh, the exercise sheet has some hints. So if you get stuck or, or don't know how to start beginning with exercise, just look at the final page. I'm not sure if the printed uh, exercise sheets will have uh, the hints. Okay, now my time is over. Uh, if you have any questions, then maybe ask it, or you can also uh, ask me after the lecture.